Good morning, church. Welcome to this week's live stream. And especially for those of you who may be visiting or joining us for the first time, we just want to say welcome. We get to worship together today. Even if it's just through this format of live streaming, we're still coming together as one church to worship our God. And that's that's a significant thing. That's a huge thing that we get to worship together. In fact, we worship all kinds of things in our lives sometimes, don't we? We worship things that we don't even realize we're worshiping sometimes. I was thinking back on Luke chapter 4 where, where uh, the enemy tries to tempt Jesus. And his, Jesus' response to that, when, when the enemy showed him the kingdoms of this world and offered him all of the kingdoms of this world, Jesus' response in verse 8 was that we should worship God and serve Him only. That it's about Him. It's not about the kings of this, kingdoms of this world. And we do that, we worship all different kinds of things, but this is a time right now where we get to focus our attention on what truly matters, worshiping and serving our one true God. And so as we do that this morning, I just encourage you to press in, really connect with God as we sing through words and music this worship to Him. Let's join and worship together this morning. you promise 
Jesus Christ, passion in his name, traded all his glory for our shame. Like he rose from freedom from the ashes, I will rise from death. Jesus for everything you're doing in our lives. Thank you that despite the craziness and the lack of certainty in our lives, God, you are still God. You're still good. You still love us. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did on the cross. <laughs> and that the life we have in you is stronger than anything else. We love you, Jesus. We're so thankful for you. Worship you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Well, Antioch, you guys have done this a million times. Come on, get out your phone. Text somebody from Antioch. Tell them you love them. We miss you guys. We love you guys. Let's have a great Sunday morning. Hey, good morning, Antioch Church. Hey, we're gonna get ready to receive tithes and offerings this morning. Thank you so much for continuously giving in this season that we've been in. The best way for you to do that is to hit the give button in the chat below. That gives you an option to set up recurring or one-time giving. Hey, if this is your first time joining us, we are pumped that you have found us in the midst of this crazy season and we wanna send you a free gift. So if you wanna hit the welcome button also in the chat below, we'll get some information on you and we'll send you that free gift. Hey, the two announcements I have for you today are that we are continuing doing Antioch Devos together. We are in the book of Proverbs, chapters 6 through 10 this week. And the last announcement I have for you is super exciting. We are launching First Sunday, which is an in-person gathering starting August 2nd. That's our first First Sunday, 9 a.m. service here at the church. We are gonna do all the social distancing, all the masks and everything like that. There is so much more information 
as well as registration for that service that you can find by hitting the first Sunday button in the tab. It will take you to an information page that has everything you need to know. So please go there because you must register in order to come and join us for First Sunday. We are so excited. Let's jump into the Word together. Hey, good morning, Antioch. I'm so glad that you have joined us on our live stream. Uh, yeah, we're still coming via live stream and looking forward to our first Sunday, as you've heard, coming up on August 2nd. But uh, this morning, um, we've been actually, we jumped back last week into a series called God Questions. We're actually going to take a break from that this week, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. But really important for the, the content that I'm going to cover this morning, uh, especially if you're visiting for the first time and not, are, are not aware of where you can access the information that I'll be covering this morning. As you're watching through the online interface right now, there's a little tab that says Notes, and you can go and click that, and it'll have all the things I'm going to cover today. As well as, if you haven't already, you can download the Uversion app, and you can actually go to the events, the live section, which says Antioch Church, which has all of the notes that I'm going to cover. Uh, probably uh, this Sunday more than ever, you're going to want to probably access the notes, because I'm going to cover a lot of information with some uh, things that you'll probably want to cut and paste and save for later, uh, so you can, can uh, access those things. But this morning, I, I wanted to, to take some extended time. This message may be a little bit longer than the previous ones that, that we've had on the live stream. But obviously, we're all aware of the more than just the coronavirus, which seems to dominate our, our, our attention right now. We have been walking through a very difficult season of racial unrest in our country. I know, at least in my, my lifetime, it's probably one of the most extended times with protests and uh, obviously, the things that have happened that have come as a result of uh, the murder of, of George Floyd. And uh, I have mentioned things here and there regarding uh, the topic of race and racism and inequality and injustice in different messages over the last eight weeks or so. But I want you to know this morning we're going to talk about this reality. We're going to talk about racism and inequality and the fact that we have a problem. And let me tell you, the reason I've waited this long to address it is because initially when all this began to unfold and the protests started to rise, everybody had an opinion. Everybody had to say something. And the Lord told me, listen. You need to listen to the voices of people that are not normally heard. You need to listen to your African-American brothers and sisters and leaders and friends. You need, before you even open your mouth, you need to listen because there's so much of what you think you know that you really don't know. And so over the last couple of months, I've really taken time to listen, to th learn things and hear people's stories and hear people's journeys and understand what, what's going on in the lives of people, what's happening in the African-American community, how do we handle the reality that racism is real and yet some of us have a difficulty in acknowledging that and sometimes even ignore the reality of it. So this morning I want you to know I, I want to be sensitive in this topic, but also I want you to hear my heart and I want you to understand that what drives this underneath the surface is God's love for people and the truth of the Bible and what the church is supposed to look like in the world today. But I want you to understand, just as a qualifier before we get into this, this dialogue and this conversation and this, this what I'm going to speak about this morning, this is not about black versus the police. Because in the reality, people have made this simply about a community of people versus the police. And that misses the point. And the reason it misses the point, although we know this is sparked out of pr police brutality, which has to be addressed, but to somehow say that all police officers are bad because of those officers and what they did to George Floyd or others who've obviously done things that have, should not have been done to the African-American community is to take a handful of police officers and then broad brush all the police officers as though they're all racist and they're all bad. See, to do that would be the same to go the other way, which is to say, if one black person does something wrong, then all black people somehow are that way. We don't want to do that on either extreme because I pray for our police officers. I care for our police officers as I do for the African-American community. This is not that conversation. So please don't take it that way. But this is an important time for us to talk about the reality of racism, that we do have a problem in our culture that we need to deal with. So this morning, as we walk through this, I want to start with some things you can find on the notes, but some working definitions for the phrase, a couple of key phrases that I will use throughout this, this morning. The first one is racism. How do we define, what is, it, what is a, an easy definition to understand what racism is? Racism is a mindset that deems people as superior or inferior instead of equal according to their ethnicity. So it's, it's a pecking order. It's a 
it's a value order that somebody is superior, somebody is inferior, based basically on the color of someone's skin, the culture they come from, their ethnicity. Now, the second definition I will work with is e inequality. Inequality is the outcome of actions and systems influenced by racism. So inequality is the result of a racist, mi a racist mindset or the way that you, th you view other people. And so those two things, racism and inequality, they work hand in hand in our culture. And so I want us to understand those things this morning. And I know even as you're, you're, you're sitting down this morning to watch this, that, that for most of us, there's, I've seen in our culture over the last couple of months and in my lifetime when there is racial unrest, that there's kind of three ways that we, we have a tendency to default to, to respond to what's going on. The first one is that, that some of us will just deny it. Uh, and we'll say things like, it's not a problem. I don't know what everybody's making such a big deal about. Racism is not a problem. That's, that's to live in denial of the reality of what's true in our culture. Or maybe you fall into a second category, and that is that you deflect it. It's, that it's not that it's not a problem. It's just, it's not my problem. It's a problem, but it's somebody else's problem that they need to deal with. But then there's a third category that we have to come to grips with, and that is this, that we, we choose to deal with it. And that means that we say, it's our problem. It, it's not that it's not a problem. It's not that it's just their problem. It's the fact that it's all of our problem. And so that's where I really want us to land this morning is to understand that racism, inequality, is our problem. As a human race, this is an issue for all of us. So before I'll, I'll give some practical things and some information, I'm going to cover a lot of ground, and please, I apologize if it feels like you're getting a fire hose of information, but I know the importance of the topic that we're addressing this morning, and so I wanted to take some time to do that. But, but you may be asking, why is this so important? Pastor John, why are, you, why are you addressing this this morning? I'll tell you, because this is important to God. The issue of racism and inequality is important to God. Why? Because since the beginning of time, people have separated over skin color and ethnicity. And God never intended humanity to live separately that way. In fact, there's two things I wanted to remind you of from the scriptures. First off, we are Antioch Church. And if you're new to our live stream or been, been watching, one of the things that's true of Antioch, our name comes from the New Testament. It comes actually out of the Bible in Acts chapter 11, which describes a church back 2,000 years ago and some key elements of that church and how today we are, we are striving to be a modern day reflection of the values and the mission of Antioch Church in the book of Acts. One of those things is that the church of Antioch in the book of Acts was a diverse church. In fact, it's so powerful to know that as the gospel, which started with Judaism, but then was spread beyond that, that when you get to the city of Antioch and the church of Antioch, this is the first place where the gospel on a large scale branched from the Jewish community, one particular ethnicity, to Gentiles, to non-Jews. In fact, it says this in Acts chapter 11, verse 20. It says, some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. So now there's this, this racial gap that's been filled, this ethnic gap now that's going beyond their own race. And this happens at Antioch. And that's why embedded in our DNA and as a church is to strive to overcome the differences that we experience because of ethnicity, realizing that the gospel is equally for all. But even more so, if you underscore the importance, and this is how we know how important this is, if you were to read through the book of Acts, you will see something very interesting. In Acts chapter 2, we call it the birth of the church, the day of Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit was poured out on the followers of Jesus for the purpose of power and mission to, to spread the gospel. That's the birth of the church. And if you kind of go through the first few chapters that follow chapter 2, you get, you get to chapter 5, which is the first major crisis in the church, and it deals with hypocrisy, somebody saying one thing and doing another. But then you get to Acts chapter 6, and the second issue, the second serious issue that is dealt with in the first church in the book of Acts is one over inequality based on ethnicity and language. In Acts chapter 6, I'm going to read this, verses 1 through 7. This is what they deal with. I want you to listen to this story because they took this so seriously and how they went about it because they realized it mattered to God. So starting in verse 1 of Acts chapter 6, 
uh, that you'll see this on the screen. It says, now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists, and Hellenists are, um, are Jews who had been kind of dispersed outside of Israel, and they spoke Greek. They didn't speak Hebrew. So right away, they are kind of considered different. Why? Because they may have a mix of ethnicities, but they certainly don't speak Hebrew. So they're almost looked as though they're non-Jewish, and so there's this separation. So, so there's a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews, the Jews, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So this is the first, this is the, the church. This is people who are coming together who are followers of Jesus, and now there's this disparity, there's this inequality. In verse two, in the 12, this is the 12 apostles, they summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brother, it says this, Brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we'll ap appoint to this duty. Then it goes on in verse four. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So the apostles were saying, listen, this is our focus, but this is a really important thing. So we're going to appoint some people to take care of this, this inequality. It says in verse five, and what they said, please the whole gathering, because they had pulled the whole church together. This is so important. It says they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, Spirit Philip, uh, Prochorus, Nicanor, and Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a, prosl a proselyte of Antioch. So this is the seven they chose. These they set before the apostles. They prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of, priests, or of the priests became obedient to the faith. So what's going on there? Because this is so important to God, this is important to the church, that they appoint seven people filled with the Holy Spirit that acknowledge they have good reputation. These are solid people. Why? Because it isn't just we're dealing with some kind of small issue here. We're dealing with a, a, a need for equality with the distribution of food of people who come with different language and some different ethnicity that need to be equal. And it's interesting when you read through this, the seven that they select from what we can tell were not from the Hebrew side, they were from the Hellenist side, which means they selected seven people not from the side of privilege, but for what the side that was experiencing the inequality, they picked seven from that side, what? To oversee the distribution equally. This is so important. Why? Because here we are six chapters into the book of Acts, four chapters after the birth of the church, and already what are they dealing with? Inequality in the church based on ethnicity and language. They took it so seriously. Here's the question I have for us, Antioch Church, followers of Jesus. Do we take this as seriously as the first church did? Do we take this as seriously as God does because he loves people? The rhetorical answer is yes, we have to because it matters to God. So with that understanding, I want to address some barriers that you and I have to overcome regarding racism and inequality that we experience and live in today. Things that I have learned, things that I have uh, gleaned in my life, as well as over the last couple of months of, of listening. The first one is this. We have to overcome the barrier of ignorance, which is we just don't know. And this is important because we don't know what we think we know. And so when we engage the concept of racism and inequality, we have to, especially if you're white like me, you have to approach it with humility. You have to understand this. And I, I've shared this uh, that a number of weeks ago, we had a, a Pastor Willie Gray, who pastors the Missionary Baptist Church here in Simi Valley. And as African-American leader, he shared his insights with us. And he really challenged us. And I mentioned last week uh, when we were talking about the Good Samaritan, the challenge of of knowing all of U.S. history, not just the one side that kind of, kind of laces a little bit of slavery into it, but realize how embedded our history is with uh, oppression of African Americans and slavery. And so I, I took some time to do that. But there's two, two things I think that we are ignorant of that we have to become knowledgeable in, that are part of this ignorance barrier. The first one is this, is the full story of our own history as a country. I took U.S. history, and I understand history, and I, I know we talked about slavery, but we need to understand so much of, our, our, of, of what we even see today is shaped by the fact that we, we literally kidnapped a culture of people from a different continent, transported them over to our country for one purpose, to sell them and use them as slaves for our own economic and growth benefit. That's what has happened. 
And so if you look at this, you go back to 1619, that's the first time slaves came from Africa, which by the way, it was really interesting that the ship that they got off, there was a handful of them, those slaves had actually been stolen from another ship that was also transporting. And so they get here, but so that th they already come for that purpose. Now you fast, fast forward a little bit, you get to the birth of our country and, and in actually in 1790, the first legislation was passed to establish what a citizen is in our country. And specifically at that time, citizens had to be white. The law was written in such a way that, that it literally eliminated black people and native people from being citizens. So it's already embedded at the earliest part of our, our history. And then obviously you move forward again to 1865. You, you see the, actually the, the conclusion of the Civil War, which was this battle over the South and the North. You know this, that slavery was the primary issue because the South realized apart from slavery, they had, they, their hope for economic prosperity would go away. And so what happens is we get the end of the Civil War, the, the abolition of save, slavery, we get the 13th Amendment. But embedded in the 13th Amendment that, also, that obviously sets the slaves free is embedded this, that you are free except for the clause that is included in the 13th Amendment, which says except for incarceration for being convicted of a crime. Now, if you read history that you'll understand, you start to see that what happens with this is that that little phrase is used in the 13th Amendment, especially in the South post-Civil War, to create... Um, law enforcement around the incarceration of black people. Why? So that they could be once again returned into slavery under the guise of the law. So literally, if you read history, you'll find that African Americans were arrested for any and every activity, for loitering, for whatever. Why? So that they could be incarcerated again, put on chain gangs, what? And once again, actually return to some of the very plantations that they were set free from. That's embedded in. That's why, that's kind of the beginning of the tension between African American community and law enforcement that still even remains to this day. That's, that's the history of it. And so this is important for us to understand this because today this has contributed even to the outcome of some of the things that we experience in culture today. More African Americans are in prison, far more higher percentage than they are percentage of the culture. They have less access to health care. They have less access to education, housing opportunities because there's something that's still laced from the past that they are dealing with. There's a result that we have in our culture today is that some people have privileges that others don't, which leads to really the, the second thing that, that we, we need to understand, the, the second reality of of the ignorance we have to overcome is first of our owning our own history. We're ignorant of history. Second is that we're ignorant of the existence of privilege. And privilege is this understanding that, that because of the color of one's skin, certain things are afforded to you that others don't have access to. Or there are more barriers for somebody who, have, who, who comes from an African-American community than there is for someone who comes from a white community. And this is the reality that, that plays out in our lives. You know, one of the most basic understandings of this, of, of what, what white, what we would call white privilege, is many times the way that, that African Americans are engaged by law enforcement. And that is, and this is true, and I've talked to so many of my uh, African American leaders and friends, and, and their experience is consistent across the board. It's happened so many times. So as a, as a, as a white individual, if I'm speeding, and I see the lights come on behind me, and I get pulled over, what is my greatest concern? I'll tell you my greatest concern is how much is this ticket going to cost me? That's, that's my concern. And I've talked to my African-American friends. If the light comes on behind them and they get pulled over, their greatest concern is not how much is this ticket going to cost. Their greatest concern is, am I going to get put in handcuffs? Am I going to be injured? Am I even going to go home tonight or I'm going to be somehow arrested? Or the worst case scenario, am I going to lose my life? I'll tell you, when I've been a pill, pilled over, none of those things have ever crossed my mind. What is that? That is because the color of my skin means that I'm just dealing with a speeding ticket, while some others, because of the color of their skin, are dealing with what? Sometimes life and death situations. And you might say, oh, Pastor John, that's not true. No, it is true. Sit down and talk to, if you have, have African-American friends, because this has happened over and over and over again. That's privilege. 
Now, what I want to do is, is I actually have played this video before, but there's a, there's a great video that illustrates. It's about three or four minutes long. So what I want you to watch it again. And it's actually a youth pastor who used this in his youth group to, to talk about how, what privilege looks like. And he sets it up as a race to see what it looks like, how privilege actually gives many people a head start over those that don't have privilege. So let's watch this together. Hey, line up, line up, everybody line up. We're about to race. Everybody line up. Shoulder to shoulder, take off your backpacks. Basketball, line up, we're about to race. Hey, we are, we are racing for a $100 bill. The winner of this race will take this. It's a $100 bill. Before I say go, I'm gonna make a couple statements. If those statements apply to you, I want you to take two steps forward. If those statements don't apply to you, I want you to stay right where you're at. Take two steps forward if both of your parents are still married. Take two steps forward if you grew up with a father figure in the home. Take two steps forward if you had access to a private education. Take two steps forward if you had access to a free tutor growing up. Take two steps forward if you've never had to worry about your cell phone being shut off. Take two steps forward if you've never had to help mom or dad with the bills. Take two steps forward if it wasn't because of your athletic ability, you don't have to pay for college. Take two steps forward if you never wondered where your next meal was going to come from. I want you guys up here in the front just to turn around and look. Every statement I've made has nothing to do with anything any of you have done. Has nothing to do with decisions you've made. Everything I have said has nothing to do with what you've done. We all know these people up here have a better opportunity to win this $100. Does that mean these people back here can't race? No. We would be foolish to not realize we've been given more opportunity. We don't want to recognize that we've been given a head start. But the reality is we have. Now, there's no excuse. They still got to run their race. You still got to run your race. But whoever wins this hundred dollars, I think it'd be extremely foolish of you not to utilize that and learn more about somebody else's story. Because the reality is, if this was a fair race and everybody was back on that line, I guarantee you some of these black dudes would smoke all of you. And it's only because you have this big of a head start that you're possibly going to win this race called life. That is a picture of life, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing you've done has put you in the lead that you're in right now. When I say go, on your mark, get set, go. If you didn't learn anything from this activity, you're a fool. So you can see that everything that maybe somebody has because they were raised in a affluent or a white family, they may have opportunities and advantages that those who were raised in African-American family don't have. That's the, the issue of privilege. So we have to acknowledge the, the, the ignorance of our own history and the ignorance that privilege is a real thing that we have to address, which leads to the second barrier to overcome. First one is ignorance. The second one is indifference. And that is that we just don't care.
Why? We go back to that same thing. It's not my problem or it's their problem. If you're a follower of Jesus, the problems of humanity are our problems. That's the way it works. Remember, last week we talked about the Good Samaritan and the two religious people who walked by the man who was beaten and robbed. That was the the priest and the Levite, the two spiritual religious people. And if you recall from the story, what did they do? Absolutely nothing. They were completely indifferent to this man's suffering. And it was the Samaritan who was what moved with compassionate action. So that's why so many people, especially I know of experience, because I I am a white, obviously a white person who sees this and hears this all the time. When things like what happened with George Floyd occur and they blow up, what happens is there's protests and maybe sometimes there's rioting and there's all these things that are going on. And so the, the African American community is now wanting the system to be blown up. They want to blow up everything. And the white community, community just wants it to blow over. Why? Because we want to know when the protests are going to stop so I can get back to life as normal. And see, that, that right there is an indifference to the reality of what a community is experiencing. And we have to be willing to own that. You see, we have a tendency, and this isn't just true for the white community, but it is true for all communities, is that we have a tendency to want to distance ourselves from brokenness. Distance ourselves from perceived danger. Distance ourselves from what is different so that we can be in what is perceived safety and something that looks similar to me. How do we know this is true? Well, I, for, for the most part, have been born and raised in California with a, with a short stint in Oregon as an adult. Uh, but growing up in the San Fernando Valley, I, I've watched a trend that continues to happen in cities uh, across America. And that is that when I was growing up in the San Fernando Valley, the valley was the alternative to Los Angeles. The crime rate in Los Angeles was crime climbing. The, uh, the diversity was increasing. And the growth of the African-American community was happening in L.A. So people who lived in Los Angeles wanted a safer place to live. And those primarily who are part of uh, the white culture tend to be more affluent. And when you're more affluent, what can you do? You can move to a different place, a different neighborhood. So there was, it happens in U.S. cities, white flight. So over the hill from L.A., here comes all these people moving to the San Fernando Valley. That was when I was growing up. But then what happened is the valley started to get diverse. This valley started to have more people of color. And so then people started to move to this place called Simi Valley. Why? Because, man, the valley is L.A. now, and L.A. is dangerous, and I don't want to raise my kids there, so I move. And then after Simi Valley, well, at the same time, there's this other place called the Santa Clarita Valley. And so then people start moving out there. And so it, again, is white flight. What is that? That is this, this sense of indifference. Hey, I'm guilty of this. I know. I live in Simi Valley. That I want to distance myself from the brokenness of humanity. I want to live in a safe neighborhood that, that looks like me, talks like me, acts like me. Why? So I feel better and I feel more secure when there's brokenness that is just on the other side of the hill. Here's the reality of, of that kind of mentality that we live into. You can never get away from the brokenness of humanity because you are a human being that is broken. And you can't move far enough away that eventually the diversity that we run from will catch up with us. Why? Because God wants us to be in a community and a church that is diverse. And I said this last week, and boy, I I just have thought about this so much. I'm so grateful to Jesus that he was not indifferent to my brokenness, but he came into the world and he moved into my neighborhood to be with me so that he could save my soul. That's the God of the universe. That's the Jesus that we follow. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, we're supposed to reflect who he is, which means we don't get the right to be indifferent to the brokenness of humanity, to the suffering, to the marginalization of other people. Why? Because Jesus was never indifferent to us. So we have to overcome the barrier of ignorance. You have to overcome the barrier of indifference. But then there's a third barrier that we have to overcome, and that is it's the barrier of interpretation. And that is we just don't understand. So much of, of what, what kind of sparks our ignorance is the lack of a complete perspective of what's really going on. We don't have the full picture, and we make judgment calls, and we make sta- statements, and we post on social media, but we haven't done our homework. We haven't w- looked at the, the whole picture of what's going on. H- here's an example that I'm going to steal from actually Robert Morris, who's the pastor of Gateway Church in, in, uh, in, in Texas. And he, this is good. I think this caught my attention. So 
So if I were to, if you were standing in front of me, and obviously the camera's in front of me, I hold up this water bottle, and you were to say to me, and I would say to you, hey, what does the water bottle say? Well, I would say to you, the water bottle says Kirkland sig Signature Purified Water. And it, when you're looking at this and you start to read the label, you're like, well, no, it doesn't. And I'm like, yeah, it does. It's right in front of my face. And we could get into this argument to say, no, the, the bottle doesn't say that. It says this. And we could go back and forth and back and forth. But here's the problem. In order for us to understand what we're looking at, you can't look at it from one side. What do you have to do? You have to be willing to walk around the whole issue together. Why? So I can see what you're looking at and you can see what I'm looking at. Why? So I have the broad perspective. And that's why this is so important. Let me, let me underscore this and illustrate this. As a white person, my perspective and my perception of reality is different than someone who's African-American. And let me, ex here's a perfect example. I've shared this before and I've shared this individually and I asked Harold for permission to share this again. But this really hit home for me a few years ago. Harold and I went to Costco together and we were buying uh, some TVs. The TVs you see just over my shoulder that we mounted up on our stage. So we were in Costco together and, and so we're loading up these big 70 inch TVs on this cart. And so we loaded them up and, and, and Harold happened to just be pushing the cart. And so we're pushing the cart through Costco and he leans over to me and he says, Pastor, can you, can you push the cart? And the first thing I thought is, Harold, did you injure yourself? Is it too heavy? And, and so he's, he just kind of like just pushed the cart. And so as we're going, I'm saying, Harold, what's wrong? Why do you need me to push the cart? He said, Pastor, trust me, you need to push the cart because people are looking at me. And of course, I was completely oblivious to this going on. But just at that moment, I stopped and I started looking around. And sure enough, people were looking at Harold as an African-American pushing around two TVs in Costco. Why? Because there weren't very many other African-Americans around. But the moment that I took the cart and started pushing it around, nobody gave me a second look. What is that? That's the reality of interpretation. Harold is seeing a different reality. And until I could see through his eyes, I didn't understand what would go on as an African-American living in a predominantly white city in Simi Valley and the daily experience that they would have to go through. And that's why it is so important. We have to have a change of perspective. You can't see the whole picture unless you take some steps to change your perspective. How do you change your perspective? This will be on the screen. Three things that I strongly encourage you to do to change your perspective. The first one is listen. Stop talking. By the way, many of you know, I stay off of social media because I'm so tired of hearing people talk. If we did what the Bible says, what, to be slow to speak, what, and quick to listen, we might have a perspective change. So I want to encourage you, have a conversation where you are doing very little talking and you are doing a lot of listening with somebody of different ethnicity. Listen to their journey. Listen to their story. Listen to their perspective. What's on the other side of the water bottle that you've missed? Second thing is experience. Now, not everybody can do this, but I would encourage you to travel to a place where there's different culture and different ethnicity, where you become the minority, where you become the person whose skin color sticks out, and then you'll begin to appreciate and experience different cultures and what people experience. And then the third thing is friendship. Friendship. Get some new friends from a different ethnicity. If all your friends as a white person, no offense, are wonder bread, you need to mix in some other kinds of bread into your life because it will change your perspective. So these are important things. This gets us over that barrier of interpretation to walk around the issue together to appreciate what somebody's experiencing and seeing. So those are the barriers that, that we have to overcome. But, but now, just as we kind of will we'll kind of draw eventually towards a conclusion here, how do we deal with racism and inequality? How do, how do we ad address this? Because we know it's real. We know it's not their problem. It's not, not a problem. It's our problem. So how do we do that? Four things I just want to walk through, and these are really important. And some of these you might think, this is what we have to do. And this is, again, from my listening and kind of reading and experiencing. The first one is this, is legislation. And you think, oh, Pastor John, you become some activist that wants to change the laws. No, I want you to listen to this because this is important. The, the rules and the laws that are in place are important to curb the behavior of humanity. So uh, this, this information I want to share for you is really important. I've said things, and I've heard people say things like, 
well, this is not a skin issue. This is a sin issue, and only Jesus can transform it. And the bottom line, absolutely true. Jesus is the only one that ultimately has the, the ultimate antidote for, for racism in all of humanity. But the reality of that is that when we say that, we just say, oh yeah, that they just need a heart change. They just need to be changed. And then we kind of act indifferent toward it. But here's the reality. I've learned as I've listened and experienced that there's a systematic problem that has to be addressed that comes out of individual racism. And until you address the systematic problem, you're still going to have issues that come up because laws or rules need to be adjusted to protect against racist activity or behavior. So here, here's an example. Uh, this is actually from, I was doing some listening and reading from Dr. Darius Daniels, who's a, who's a uh, great thinker and, and pastor of a church. And, and he was saying, he was talking about kind of the, the, the hand-in-hand reality of and the difference between racism and injustice. He says that, that racism is, again, what we talked about earlier, it's, it's what we feel about ourselves and other people in terms of if we feel inferior or superior. But, but racism at its core is this sense of I am better or I am superior than somebody else of a different ethnicity. He said, you can feel that all day long. You can think that all day long. That's racism. That's the core of racism. He said, but what injustice is, is injustice is when you allow that thinking and that feeling and that perspective to shape your actions. So the moment you allow the racism feelings, the racist feelings to contribute to your action, then injustice enters. Why? Because injustice is what? There's superior and inferior. There's inequality. And so he goes on to say, and this is what really caught my attention. He said, so that means that because of that, we know that ultimately... People need a heart change when it comes to racism. But what happens if there is no heart change? Do we keep on let pe- letting people allow injustice to occur? And he used this as example. He said stealing is wrong. We all know that stealing is wrong. There are laws that say if you steal, you break the law, you get arrested, you get incarcerated. So there's laws to curb that. What if we were to say, you know, stealing is really a heart issue. And until that heart issue is changed, nothing's going to change would you st- still not have laws in place that say that, listen, even though you haven't changed your heart yet and you still, you're going to now have to face the music that you've broken the law. What, what are laws in place for? To slow down and curb the advance of evil in humanity. That's what they've always been. That's a lot of the Old Testament law, to slow down evil. And so that means that we have to have laws in place, what? To curb the, the activity of stealing. Why? Because people still want to steal. The same thing is true with racism. Because there are racist feelings and emotions that have not yet been transformed by Jesus, there needs to be guidelines, rules, and laws that curb the activity of injustice that is the outflow of racism. Now, I'm not on a campaign to tell you what laws they are, but I know that's the way that our system is set up. The law slows down the advance of evil that comes out of what? Our hearts. So that's the first thing is this idea that we deal with racism and inequality through legislation. Second one, this is more personal, is education. We don't know what we don't know. We just don't. And so we have to be willing to deal with that. So I know that, that I've touched on this, you know, I mentioned this earlier, but I've been doing so much listening and reading of, of African-American voices and other leaders that, that I know and I respect because I know that there's an education process that I need that I'm not, I'm not getting. In fact, even I've, I've talked with, with some of the, the folks within our church who are part of the African-American community, because I want to hear their stories, and, and they, I'm so grateful for their willingness to, to enlighten me on things that I don't know. But it's this educational process. And so what I, I've done, and there's far more, but, but if, you're, if you're watching on the interface online, you'll see the notes section also on version. You can access this. But here, I've given you a list of resources that I would say these are, these are things that would be a benefit for you to read or to listen to because they'll give you a perspective. Now, not all of them are going to come from a Christian perspective, but them, some are going to come from a historical reality perspective. But let me just quickly go through them. You'll see them on the list here. And if you want to cut and paste them out of the live stream and save them, you can do that. But the first one is a great book called Beyond Colorblind, Redeeming Our Ethnic Journey by Sarah Shin. She is a, a Korean American, and she comes from a really unique perspective that colorblindness is a fallacy. We all see color. In fact, we should all see color because it's about understanding color and the value of color, not being blind of color. It's a really good book. It really, really is. Then there's another one I mentioned before. Is a, there's a documentary, and you can, you can get it on Netflix, but it's also available on YouTube, uh, and it's called 13th. It's about the 13th Amendment. And I mentioned last week that 
whether you are liberal or conservative, Democrat or Republican, it lays the blame across the board politically on the reality of incarceration and slavery and injustice for the African American community. So it's a tough one to watch. It'll be, it'll be convicting. There's another short TED talk that's called uh, Why I, as a Black Man, Attended the KKK Rallies by uh, Darren Davis. So I'll mention that a little bit later, but that's a really powerful story. And then also I put the privilege race, which we played just a little bit earlier that you can access. Uh, there's another, another TED talk by uh, a lady named Melody Hobson. It's called Colorblind or Color Brave, and she talks about going beyond colorblindness what, to actually being brave enough to, to address the issues that are surrounding skin color and ethnicity in our country. And then I really found one of the easiest and simplest ways to access American history in a very easy form is to go to history.com and just type in, in fact, there's a link there you can go that talks about American history and slavery and, and kind of is very enlightening, kind of the things that you either forgot or you were unaware of. So I wanted you to have those resources because that's part, been part of my educational process and I encourage that for, for you. Two more quick things as, as before we, we conclude, and that is this. To deal with racism and equality, the, the third thing that we need to do is this thing called reconciliation. This gets so personal for us. You see, the the division and the separation between ethnicities is at its core a relational issue that requires reconciliation between people and between God and us. That is the core because it is core. It is an issue. In fact, the power of the gospel, the power of what Jesus did in his death and his resurrection actually goes after the separation of ethnicities and the brokenness that racism seems to produce in our culture. Now, there was a divide when Jesus was on the planet and as the church was birthed, and it was a divide between Jews and Gentiles based on what, on also on religion, but based on ethnicity. But Jesus' death on the cross actually deals with that inequality and deals with the racism that is already embedded in humanity. Listen to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. It says this, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away from God are brought near through the blood of Christ's death. Christ himself is our peace. He made both Jewish people and those who are not Jews one people or one person. They were separated as if they were, there were a wall between them, but Christ broke down that wall of hate by giving his own body. The Jewish law uh, had many commands and rules, but Christ ended that law. His purpose was to make the two groups of people become one new people in him and in this way make peace. It was also Christ's purpose to end the hatred between the two groups, to make them into one body, and to bring them back to God. Christ did all of this with his death on the cross. That's the issue of racism embedded in the truth, the good news of the gospel, which Jesus' death on the cross, what? It destroys the hostility of between ethnicities in the world. Why? Because we finally realize we're all sinners, all desperately in need of God's grace, all on equal ground, what, of our sinfulness and need of a Savior. And that Savior wants us to be reconciled together. Being reconciled together. Racism and inequality will only come to an end when we have right relationships with each other. It is a relational issue at its core, and we have to be reminded of this. I mentioned Daryl Davis earlier, and you'll see this in his TED Talk, but his journey is amazing. As an African-American musician, he wanted to know why white people hated him. He just couldn't understand it. And so he did something that was completely, completely like beyond what anybody would think to do. He didn't just go in and talk to any white person. He actually connected through some different circumstances with the Grand Master of the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, the most racist organization in our nation's history. And somehow was able to, through I think some deception, get a meeting with him and ask him the question, why? And he, in long story short, out of this encounter, he started a friendship. Even though the Grand Master, this guy said, you know, you are inferior to me and I will always be better. So Daryl Davis started showing up to KKK rallies and over time became friends. In fact, they would have each other over to each other's houses. And over a period of time, they became such good friends 
that that Grand Master walked away from the KKK. In fact, it's powerful. You'll see in the TED Talk, he literally will open a wardrobe or a closet behind him and he will pull out the Grand Master's robe and said, when he left the Ku Klux Klan, he gave me his robe. Why? That was because somebody decided to bridge the divide and begin a relationship that broke down the wall of division. God is calling us to bridge the relational gap that we have in ethnicity. It is not okay to live, no matter your ethnicity, it is not okay to live exclusively amongst your own ethnicity because the gospel calls us out. It calls us out to be people who love all people as God does. And here's the final thing before we conclude today. The final point of dealing with racism and equality is this thing, this outcome, this goal, and it's called transformation. It's change. It's a difference. It's something that used to be this way, and now it's this way. It's somebody who used to be this way, and now is this way. It's what Jesus does in humanity, is he brings transformation. And why is this so important? We need to be transformed in this area because I want to circle back around again and talk about how important this is to God. Hear me. So in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, I'm going to read in just a moment, but I want you to understand, if you don't know the book of Revelation, the mo- majority of the book of Revelation, which gives us glimpses into eternity and into heaven, was this vision that God gave to the apostle John. And it's, it's this powerful, these images that God gives. And it's almost as though God, God did. He, he, Jesus encounters John, and it's as though he pulls back the curtain of heaven, and he says, John, take a peek. Take a look. This is what heaven looks like. This is what heaven will be like. And John actually records what he sees in Revelation 7, verse 9, where he says this. He says, after this, I looked. So he's looking into heaven. This is what he's seeing in heaven. And behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, which is Jesus, clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands. So he's looking into heaven, and what is he seeing? He's not seeing one ethnicity. He's seeing all of them. Standing before who? Jesus. These are all followers of Jesus standing and worshiping at the throne. And what he's saying is that heaven is the most diverse place he's ever seen. Now, why is this important for us? Because you don't have to turn there, but I want you just to, to capture this for a moment. We, we call it the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus taught us how we should pray. And if you recall the prayer, he starts it out this way. He says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then he says this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what is, what is Jesus saying? What did John see in heaven? He saw diversity. He saw people from different language groups and different people groups and different skin colors, all unified together. And so when Jesus says, you pray what? That my will will be done on earth, what? As it's already occurring in heaven. So what is God saying? The church, culture, pr- primarily the church, followers of Jesus, what? The church should be the most diverse place in the world. And I take ownership as a leader that the church is not, and it needs to be. So when I pray for God's will to be done, guess what I'm praying for? I'm praying for a diversity in the church. Why? Because that's God's will. That's his desire. That's what we're praying for. This is so important for us to see, and and I want you to, to, as we we draw to conclusion today, I want you to ask this question of yourself, and I want you to be totally honest with yourself. Who is it that strikes pain fear, or hatred in you according to their skin color. Be honest with yourself. When that person walks into your neighborhood or you walk into the neighborhood or that person walks in through the door, you feel something inside of you. See, if you're, if you're a Korean or you're Chinese, many times that person is someone who's Japanese because of the, the, the horrific things that the Japanese did in the early part of the 1900s and as well in, in World War II to Korea and to China. Well, maybe if, if you're an African-American, if you're honest, it's a white person. There's pain, there's hatred, there's angst. Why? Because what you've done or how you've not cared for my community. If you're white, many times, it's anybody of different ethnicity. It's anybody with a different skin color. It's an immigrant that strikes fear in us. 
for Native Americans, it's the white person because of what's been happening in the history. For a Latino person, many times it's a white person. We could go on and on and on. I've, I've told you about my own experience when I went to camp a number of years ago with a men's retreat and thought I had no racist bone in my body only to find when an African-American man came into the room. I thought, oh no, we're unsafe. And how God convicted me of that and actually led to reconciliation with a man I didn't even know. Me asking forgiveness for the very feeling or thought that came into my mind and God working deeply in my life. Because God wants to rinse that out of us. Why? Because that's racism inside of us. He wants us to see people and see their skin color and love them equally as he does. And let me, let me close with this because I think this is the important thing and this will be the end and then I want to just briefly give an invitation. I know this has been longer than normal but I think it's so important that we need to know that this issue of racism, so in, really an in inequality based on any, any ethnicity, any economic level, inequality creeps into the church so gradually. And so it isn't that we just can just think, oh, we're fine. We have to fight against it because it's our sinful nature by default to create places of inequality. I'll close with this. There's a very famous passage in 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It deals with what we, we many times will read a passage about communion, about the body of Christ, about the blood of Christ, but we're not going to take communion today. But I want you to understand that Paul addresses in the Corinthian church a huge issue that has been created in a short period of time. He's saying to them, listen, you guys have a problem here. And here's your problem. When you come together, because when they did communion in their day, it was a meal. It wasn't just a cracker and juice. So when you come together for the Lord's Supper, when you come together to remember the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus, you remember his brokenness, that he shed his blood for our forgiveness because we're all sinful. When you come together to do that, some of you are eating and going first and leaving none for those who come later. Some of you are drinking the wine before the others and taking more than is your portion and becoming drunk before others. And what was happening was this was based on economic inequality. Because the wealthy people in the church at Corinth, because they're wealthy, they were able to what, arrive earlier because their jobs and their income wasn't dictating their schedule like those who lived in poverty who may had to work longer and had to come later to the feast. So when the poor would show up, there was nothing left. While the rich had eaten to their fill and some of them had become drunk. And Paul addresses this and says, this is not right. The very thing you're celebrating is the equality of humanity to access the gospel and the truth of Jesus' death on the cross. But now you're what? Already making it about what? Those who have access and those who are wealthy get to go first, while those who don't have income and don't have access don't get to go at all. So you see how subtly it moves into the church and our lives. And I share that because this is so important. I'll end with this. The truth of Jesus' love for the world, him coming into the world, addresses the core issue in all of us. We are broken. We are sinners. And apart from Jesus, we have no hope. We have no hope for ourselves. We have no hope for the world. And that's why I want to close with this. If you're watching today, a number of people, I, I want to challenge you. If you're a part of Antioch, if you're a follower of Jesus, Please do not allow this message to be somehow, okay, well, that's nice. Pastor John got his racism message out of the way, and now he can move on. No, I, want, I challenge you to do your homework, to do education, to go back and talk to people of different ethnicity, to read the Bible and read through the book of Acts and discover it's embedded in there. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, it's got to be important to you. But I want to encourage you to let the Holy Spirit convict you. But maybe you're watching this and you've been on the receiving end of inequality and you've struggled and there's been pain in your life. I want to say I sincerely, on behalf of the church, the behalf of followers of Jesus, on behalf of white people, just like me, I ask for your forgiveness. For our ignorance, our indifference, our faulty interpretation. But then the third group of people, maybe one of the things that you need today, and this is so important, if you're watching today and you don't know Jesus you need to know him because he's the one that's going to heal your heart. He's, he's the only one that can take a broken person and he can bring forgiveness and heal him. He's the only one who can take a racist and help a racist to love people genuinely at the core. So today, if you need Jesus, I'm going to pray in just a moment. And you know that you do because you're feeling that sense right now. I'm going to strongly encourage you to take a step to do that. And that is, you know, I need to surrender my life to 
let Jesus lead my life, listen to his guidance and his wisdom in my life, offer over my sin and my brokenness and my failure and my racism and the evil that's inside of me and let him begin to transform me from the inside out. And if you want to do that, you can do that today. And as I pray, you just pray yourself and you say, okay, Jesus, because he hears your prayers, I choose to give my life to you. And I'm going to ask you to take one very practical step when you do that. On the chat right now, you're going to see something that pops up that says committing my life to Jesus or raising my hand. And I'm going to ask you just to click that button. And when you click that button, it'll, it'll lead you eventually to a place where uh, you can actually fill out a little form that says, hey, I'm committing my life to Jesus. And the reason we do that is because obviously in this live stream format, we can't see each other face to face. We want to connect with you because there's some steps. There's a journey that you're saying yes to that we want to help you into. It's not about church membership. It's not about anything that is somehow becoming a part of the club. It's about getting connected to Jesus. And so please don't miss this moment to give your life to Jesus today as we pray because he is the one who transforms our souls and allows us to experience his grace for all people. So Jesus, we thank you that when you sent the Holy Spirit to birth the church 2,000 years ago, you knew that we as human beings would struggle with the inequality and the racism around our ethnicities. And so you addressed that early on, but you did something even more important that when you died on the cross, you gave us the ability to be forgiven for our sin that keeps us apart from each other and apart from you. Just as you said, Lord, in in Ephesians, that the two different groups or the three or the four or the 10 different groups who had hatred and hostility can be brought together through the cross. So Lord Jesus, would you heal our broken hearts? Would you heal the wounds of racism? Would you convict, Lord, those of us who still have that residue within us so that we might love people as you love people? And then, Lord, for those right now that are making a commitment to follow you, would you give them the courage to step forward and say, I'm going to choose to follow Jesus and let him transform my life. Lord, hear their prayers right now. Hear their thoughts. And Lord Jesus, send your spirit into their lives to transform their souls. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you are doing in us in your name. Amen. So as we conclude, I want to encourage you, take time to do your homework, to get a perspective, to talk to somebody of different ethnicity, and let God lead you in this process to get us to a place where at least in the church, we can be a model of how we overcome the issues of racism and experience the equality of the gospel that is accessible for all. God bless you. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks once again for joining us this week. And just a couple things before you go. Wanted to remind you that if you're tuning in for first service in just a little bit at 1030, our kids church is coming up. So you don't want to miss out on that. If you're watching for second service, make sure you join us next week at 1030 for that special kids time, a kids church. Also wanted to remind you that we have a youth live stream that happens on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. And you can email Pastor Lauren at lauren at antiochsimi.org for the access link to that uh, live stream event. Also, we're inviting you to join us for Antioch Devos, where we're reading through the Bible together. And this week, we're reading Proverbs 6 through 10. So go ahead and read that, and let's share what God is speaking to us together. Finally, you heard the big announcement. We are actually meeting in person for a parking lot service at our Antioch facility on August 2nd. We're looking forward to seeing your face there if you can make it. Thank you so much again for joining us today. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you soon.